Welcome everybody to the next episode of the Canners Review. I'm delighted to be joined on this episode by Dr. Adan de Salas Quiroga. How are you keeping it down, well? Very good. How are you, Owen? Everything Fantastic. fine? Fantastic. Delighted to have you on the show. So I know you graduated in biology, specializing in neurobiology. Can you maybe give everybody a quick overview of how you got into the cannabis industry and what your speciality is? Yes, so my <clears throat> so I study biology and I specialize in neurobiology and at some point I joined the lab of Manuel Guzman, who is a, a big figure in the cannabis research field. And I carried out a PhD mainly focused on the roles uh, governed by the endocannabinoid system in the process of brain development. So I study the the proliferation of stem cells uh, neural specification newborn neuron migration and all these processes are tightly controlled by the, the, the cb1 cannabinoid receptor and uh, the endocannabinoid system but it was interestingly a big lab in which with different lines of research so i got a, a background also in cancer research neurodegenerative diseases and yeah on other potential therapeutic uh, possibilities of cannabis. Okay, incredible. So you've got a wealth of knowledge and I'm, I'm hoping you're the, the man to be able to give everybody the information that we're looking for this episode. So the, the topic of this episode is patient access in Spain. Can you maybe mm -hmm. give everybody a breakthrough of the, the legal framework that seemed to have been passed over the last couple of weeks, the timeline mm -hmm. the patients getting access and the, the reality of the timeline, shall we say. We understand that it's a certain amount of months, but yeah. maybe uh, there are many challenges. So first of all, I would like to, to give a glimpse of the actual uh, context because a lot of people actually believe that we, we have legal access to cannabis in Spain and that's not true. So most people have heard about the, the cannabis clubs, no? So this is not actually uh, anything legal. It's something that the, the, the users and everybody found, let's say, the, the gray areas in the law. And so all this for the recreational users, but most importantly for medical users, they have to go to the black market or these clubs, which is illegal, and so they are uh, subjected to a possible fine or whatever. So what it took place, and actually it was June 27th, it was finally approved in the health commission within the Spanish parliament, uh, a text that uh, integrates the, the, the summary or the, con the main conclusions of a subcommission that was taking place for the last the, the past months, and so this subcommission gathered uh, experts, physicians, people from associations, and many different voices, and to evaluate to study the possibility of cannabis medi medical cannabis regulation in Spain. So yes, this was finally approved for with twenty votes in favor. 14 against and two abstentions. And this text kind of set, uh, not rules, but uh, suggestions on the process. And so, yeah, there are many questions. For for instance, uh, what? So we, we can get the flowers, sadly, are not included in this text. So they are only stated for experimental programs. So what it is included, so the what patients could have access to are uh, standardized products or preparations. And also what it is very interesting is this called a master preparation, master formulas, I believe is called in English. And it's something that allows for tailor-made uh, medicine because the physician uh, taking care of this patient could actually change the, the in case a patient has troubles to swallow or has any other medication that could interact with uh, cannabis uh, components or um, to actually readjust uh, 
the, the, the rate of cannabinoids to uh, allow for uh, individualized or very personalized medicine. So this is what is controlled. And who could be prescribing? It, this is not clear in the text. So they say uh, should be done by specialist physicians. And this, depending on how eventually the, the regulation adopts this point, it could be open to the primary care uh, physicians and private institutions or only for pain or a neurologist or this kind of specialist. And the patients uh, could get access to these products in pharmacies. Uh, in regular, uh, let's say, common pharmacies in the neighborhood, but also within the hospitals. And the pathologies that are actually so far included, because this is a, a prospective, uh, let's say, text, no? but so far the indications accepted are uh, multiple sclerosis, that we had already Sativex, which was accepted already in Spain to treat this uh, spasticity associated with the disease. Also, uh, we have certain types of epilepsy, uh, nausea and vomiting derived from chemotherapy, endometriosis, and also oncologic and non-oncologic pain. So these are mainly the the guidelines. And then, of course, in the text, there are many other aspects, such as the, the, the indicate to the responsible agency some points in the, in the regulation, how they should uh, ensure access to these products, and how they should uh, ensure the education of the medical professionals, and etc. Okay, amazing. So it's very in-depth analysis of it. So from the framework, just to maybe give everybody a rough little breakdown, it says that there's neuropathic pain and chronic pain allowed in that in the dispensing of the product, but it might be only by specialist doctors. So would this be a specific brain specialist or is it post-chemotherapy doctor specialist, or is that still open to interpretation yet in the finalized rules? It is still open you know, to interpretation because they say that the, the, what they say is uh, the professionals allowed are physicians with without conflict of interests, and then they say they say preferentially should be done by a specialist in the areas. Blah blah blah. So this we don't know as. Uh, so this is a, um, an initial, let's say, proposal. Then what will be eventually uh, implemented, this we don't know. And another thing that I, I forgot to mention is that the, in this text, they, they give a frame, a time work, a time frame, sorry, of six months to implement all these measures to the, the responsible agency, which we believe it's really very, I mean, being uh, realistic is not going to be in this in this time. But, well, let's, and so we still from the activists, the associations, the certain cannabis institutions, such as the Spanish Observatory of Medical Cannabis. So we need to keep doing some pressure to trying to ensure that the final adoption of this text is as as more complex uh, and sorry complete as possible. Yeah. Yeah, because the one uh, nook in the cranny from an outside perspective looking in that you can see is right. Well, it's not determined who the doctors are yet, but who gets the license to prescribe mm -hmm. the cannabis. So mm -hmm. what, what text is going to be in that license? Because if it's specific, it specifies a specific type of doctor, then I think the market will have a, a little bit of a shortfall when it comes to patient access. I think the general practitioner, if it's going to be neuropathic pain and chronic pain, a general practitioner should be able to prescribe it. But as you said, we're Definitely. Going to the industry, getting a licensing system built in six months, I mm -hmm. think it's going to be a, a, a stretch for sure. 
of course, and that makes a big, big difference because I mean, just talking about pain, no chronic pain. So the the numbers uh, estimated are one in six patients in Spain are suffering from from chronic pain. This is about eight million people in Spain, and let's let's be cautious and assume that only one third of the patients are really sensitive to cannabinoid treatment which is i mean really low number because we could assume more but let's say one third this is more than 2.5 million people that could already benefit and change their lives with this treatment so of course this is not going to take place if only specialists and and you know we need to we need to change the the healthcare professionals mind because uh, most of them have no clue about the physiopathological basis of the, the actual potential of medical cannabis so they barely heard about the endocannabinoid system and the, the control in physiology so and even less they they have no clue about the actual clinical data with of uh, the potential of medical cannabis and of course, they don't have a specific training, which is something fundamental because cannabinoids are very uh, particular type compounds. So you cannot establish the dose effect relationships that you usually do with another other drugs. So this is a challenge. This is another challenge in this process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads me right on to the next thing I want to talk about was training the doctors and nurses, because it, as, as we know that this is going to get to a stage where, as you said, it's blends and formulations of different cannabinoids that are going to be relative to each individual patient. It's not going to be there is a prescription, everybody one size fits all. So where is the training for the doctors and the nurses going to come from? Is it going to come from governmental programs where they have experts like yourself and Professor Guzman, or is it going to be investment outside capital that comes in to mm -hmm. This is a huge question mark. So we don't know. And there's no specific mention in the text. So what they say is they encourage the Spanish agent responsible agency, which is, well, it doesn't matter the name. Uh, they encourage to to ensure the medical educations of the of the healthcare profession. So, uh, to my opinion, there are perhaps four ways. No, one would be private initi initiatives, like private uh, yeah platforms which are already offering uh, courses of medical cannabis. Then, of course, we could have university linked programs either master degrees either postgraduate programs uh something which is called uh continuous training or continuous education which is somehow related to university but it's another type of uh, education and then of course the government could implement some programs associated either to hospitals, universities, or other type of um, institutions. And But then there is another and last uh, way of training these healthcare professionals, which is taking uh, actually place in other countries, as, as well as this that I already mentioned, and is that the, the, the main companies that got these um, licenses and of course, they got the interest because you know they have a, a big niche of market, and they they want these physicians to to be as uh, as educated as possible, so they could actually prescribe their products. And so brands are actually investing a lot of money into these uh, training programs. So yeah. To my opinion, these are the main four ways that we could, but there's nothing clear. We don't know which. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's going to be an interesting six months over uh, to see how everything falls into place for you guys up in Spain. And we'll have our fingers crossed over here in Ireland that you get a, a, an industry up and running that leads the way for compliance Hopefully. and regulation. It's been an and amazing helps, challenge. Yeah, Sorry. and helps a lot of patients. I mean, this is something we are, pain cannot wait. So yes, this is something we need to act now. Yeah, there, as you said, there's mm -hmm. at least a, a, a couple of million people in Spain who could be uh, benefiting from access to medical cannabis uh, products at the moment. So I hope everything goes amazing for you over the next six months, and hopefully we can touch base at the end of the year or start of 2023, and we'll get an update and see where Spain is at. But for now, thank you very much, Dan, and have a great day. Thank you, Owen. Ciao. Until next time. Have a good day. Bye.